If you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can be turning to the book of Job, Job chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Uh, Job chapter 12, and we'll begin reading in verse 9. I hope you have prayed for me this morning. And uh, the Lord makes us all will be well. Job 12 in the ninth verse. The Bible says, Who knoweth not in all the, these that the hand of the Lord had brought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Doeth not the ear try the words, and the mouth taste his meat? With, an, with the ancient is wisdom, and in length of days is understanding. With him is wisdom and strength, and he, he hath counsel and understanding. Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also, he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise You and thank You for another opportunity to be in Your house. Lord, we thank You for each one that You brought this way this morning. We understand and know they're here by divine purpose. And we praise You for that. Lord God, we pray that You'd send the Holy Ghost this way and that You would meet with Your people. Lord, that You would convict us of sin and wrongdoing, Lord, and that You would encourage us in the walk that we have. Lord, that You would uh, cause us to be glad in the Lord this morning. We pray that You would bless again Your Word to the hearts of Your people. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, where we're at in the trial of Job is this, and, and you all know this, but I want you to understand what was happening here. Uh, first, uh, the... the Lord God says, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. And he begins to tell of his service to God. Now, have you ever thought about that and, and wondered what the Lord God would say about you? Have you considered my servant Larry? Now, you know what happened next? And, and he says, doth Job not serve thee for naught? Hast thou not built a hedge about him? Now, you know, the devil was accurate in that. Satan was correct. And a lot of people uh, jump over that. But you know what? He's built a hedge about me. You, you know why I'm here this morning? Because the hedge of the Almighty. You know why I'm not some drunkard or drug addict out here on the road somewhere? It's because of the hedge of the Almighty. He has built a hedge about me, and, uh, and, and we ought to rejoice in that and respect that. Amen. And so the devil was accurate in that. Job had a hedge about him. And uh, if you remember, there were two attacks, and God authorized both of them. You know what? If you're under attack this morning, God authorized it. He, he said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And, and you see what happens. God knew what would happen. But He wanted the devil to understand what would happen. Now, with that said, I'll give you another thought because this is the more common. Sometimes you step out of that hedge. It's that God doesn't remove the hedge. You get outside of it. And you, you know what? The Lord's hedges are powerful. You know, you know remember what He said concerning the, tree, the knowledge of the tree of life? He said that He placed an angel around it so they couldn't get back to it. See, the, 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 the hedge of the Almighty is, is a very strong thing. And why would we leave it? But we leave it on a routine basis. Uh, we get out of the will of the Lord and we leave what He's provided us. But I want you to see in Job's situation that the hedge was removed to a point. And, and, and at this point, not only had he lost his riches and he'd lost his children, now he had lost his health and his friends showed up, Eliphaz and the other, and began to say, Job, this is why it happened. 
And you know what? To some extent, they were right. Now, they didn't understand it fully because they didn't know it was authored by God. You know, not one of those friends said, God sovereignly done this, and we're praying for you. In fact, none of them ever said they were praying for Him, period. Now, we're in this section now, and it's really uh, after the attack, of, uh, the attack of Satan, and he's having this conversation with his friends, and then the friends leave him, and the final section of the book of Job is this, he has a conversation with God. You know what you need to do if you're under trial this morning? You need to have a conversation with God. Amen. Right. That, that, that's your need. See, Job didn't necessarily need this criticism from his friends, although it did get his attention. What he needed was to have a conversation with God. Now, in the 12th verse, he said, uh, excuse me, uh, in uh, the verse 11, he says, Doeth not, well, we'll go back to verse uh, 9, who knoweth, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord has wrought this. See, uh, he was talking about the attacks, and he was giving God credence, saying, you know what? God did this. I'm not too upset about it. You know what? When the, when the diagnosis is cancer, God did it. Or he at least withdrew the hedge. One or the other. And either way, was he not in control? Sure he was. And, and so we shouldn't get too upset. And so Job answers him and says, well, did not God author this? Didn't He uh, uh, ha have it to happen? And he says, speaking of God, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing? You, you know whose soul my life was? And this is not the eternal soul. That word is not the eternal soul, although that is true too. He says in every living thing. So it's the living force. Uh, you know, if, if the skunk runs out in front of you, you and you hit it, God was in that. Because the uh, mighty God of heaven, very life of that skunk's in His hand. So it was just meant to happen. Right? And if we believe God sovereign, we have to, we have to believe that. And so he, he, he makes it very clear that he understood God's sovereignty in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind doeth not the ear try the words. Now, what he was saying when, when I say something to you, you try to evaluate the meaning, right? If I say hello, you know that's just a cordial way to greet somebody. So what he was saying is you need to evaluate these events in your life. When something happens, find out why. When, when, it, when, when, when a loved one is taken, find out why. Evaluate it. When, when you have a thousand dollars come out of nowhere, evaluate it and find out why. And you know what it is? It's because of the goodness of God. It is because He's gracious and kind and, and, and our very Redeemer. So Job gives his friends this advice, Doeth not the ear try the words, and the mouth taste his meat? See where it come from. Verse 12, With the ancient is wisdom. Now, uh, uh, and then he says, with length of days. And, and listen, this is not talking about things uh, uh, back uh, a thousand years ago. It means you listen to the elderly around you because they've got something to say. You know what? The generation we have now, I have never seen any less care and respect for the elderly in all my life. You know, when my, and I was only three, uh, maybe almost four when my great grandmother died. But I remember going in her house and Mama saying to me and Judy, You sit there and you don't move. And you know what? We did it. And there was respect at her grandmother and my great grandmother. See, that, that was a different age, was it not? But you know what? You'll learn some things from those people. 
If you listen to them and you hear what they have to say, you'll get some, you'll, you'll gain some knowledge and it'll be useful to you all the days of your life if you listen. Now the problem is today is that we don't listen. So Job had an understanding. You know what? He, he was really saying this. I've seen this before. My granddaddy told me about this. My grandmother mentioned something. See, then you'll understand it better down the road, won't you? See, we as the Lord's people, we wouldn't be as flabbergasted as we are by bad circumstance if we'd heard, hey, this happened to me too. This has occurred in my life and this is what God did for me. Verse 15, Behold, He that withholdeth the waters, and, uh, verse 14, excuse me, Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Now, I want you to see that if something, if there's a tragedy in your life, he, it says, a, you know what? You, you know, he was, what he was probably thinking back to, how did his youngins die? The house collapsed on him, right? He knew that God broke it down. Wasn't necessarily he's excited about losing ten children, but he did understand and know that God was in it. He he said he broke it down, and so who am I to question it? Who am I to be upset? Why would I do this thing? Because I understand that that he did it. Behold, he meaning God withholdeth the waters and they dry up also he sendeth them out and they overturn the earth with him meaning God is strength and wisdom and the deceived and the deceiver are his you know uh, that that last part is a it is hard for some to swallow but you know what the deceived belong to God you know what? Saul belonged to God. David's first wife, Michelle, she belonged to God. Was she deceived? Yes. Did she betray David? Most certainly. But she belonged to God. See, uh, when we begin to think, you know, you know why we need to think that way? It takes the hate and animosity away. Because all we can say is that's not right, but they belong to God. Right? And, and so then we as the Lord's people, uh, uh, we need to understand and know if you stand in grace, it's because of the goodness and, and, the, and the blessings of God. Go with me over to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 11. Deuteronomy chapter number 11. And I'm just going to read verse 6 for your hearing. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 6. The Bible says this, And what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the sons of Reuben, now the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their households and their tents and the substance that was in their possession in the mess or the middle of Israel. Now I want you to see that God did that deliberately. He was in that. He, and you know what? Who created those sons? God did. Who, 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 who came up and had this rebellion? Dathan and remember the earth and Korah and the earth swallowed them up. You know what? God made them. He for the express purpose of rebellion. He, he, he knew it was going to happen from the beginning. And then why is we as the Lord's people then, why can't we learn about the deceived? See, you know what Korah's problem was, is he was deceived. Remember, remember how that all came up? What was the first words of Korah in the rebellion? Do you remember? Moses, you take too much on yourself. Right? You know what? It's not for you to question. It's not for you to question the workload of somebody else. 
And, and, and if you're real, if you're not real careful, you'll even get jealous. If someone is preaching the gospel and uh, doing some door knocking and maybe some street preaching and, 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 and you know being effective in God, it's, it's the flesh's nature to get jealous. And you say, you know what? He's just doing that to be seen. He's just doing that so everybody will look at Him. You know what? This is the truth of the matter. You don't know why they're doing that. And anything less than that, you're deceiving yourself. You're, you're thinking that, uh, that, that you understand and know. Now go with me to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18, uh, verse 29. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 29. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Now, where this little bit of Scripture comes from is uh, 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 it was the same place whenever they were, they were surrounded, Israel was surrounded by the enemy and they were closing in on them and, and Hezekiah went up to the temple and just spread his needs out before God. You remember that? And, and, and so he says here, the enemy come and said, don't you let Hezekiah deceive you. This thing's about over. And, and you know what? Satan comes to us and says, don't you let that pastor deceive you. You're living like it was a hundred years ago. Women, you, you get you a career and put on your britches and hit the bricks. You know what? That's a deception. But Satan comes and does it all the time, does he not? You can't make it without two incomes these days. You'll starve to death. Right? He'll come with those little things. What you need is another new car. No, you don't need that debt. Right? And so the, 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 even in Hezekiah's day, the way that, that he was doing it was to deceive the people. The way the enemy came along was telling them that something was, that told them a lie, deceived them into believing a, a, an untruth. Now, in the modern day, it goes like this. You just say this little prayer, you can even read it off the card, and everything's going to be A-OK. -okay. You know what that is? It's a deceiver. But don't it sound good? <laughs> Sounds a lot easier than wait, waiting on the Lord till He speaks to you, don't it? <laughs> sounds a whole lot easier. You know what? Yeah, it, 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 even with baptism, it sounds a lot easier to go get dumped than wait on the goodness of God, does it not? But you know what? With that comes deception. You know what? It is always easier to believe a lie than the truth. Amen. Because sometimes the truth scolds. Sometimes the truth... <coughs> Uh, sometimes the truth is pretty rough, is it not? And so we as the Lord's people very frequently find ourselves in this. Now, drop down to 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 10. Thus shall he speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thy trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be liber delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. So, see, it didn't work when he talked to the multitude. So then he went right to the leader, to Hezekiah himself, and said, listen, Hezekiah, you're messing up. You know, sometimes Satan will come to me and say, you know what, Larry, you don't have me left. You better change something you're doing. And you know what it is? It's a lie right out of the pits of hell. <laughs> but you know what? It's sometimes more pleasant than the truth. When you get down to about 15, you know what? That's a pretty small church. But you know what? We need to just go on with God. We need to look at... <laughs> 
look at the enemies and look at Satan and said, you know what, Satan? You're a liar. <coughs> There's victory in standing for the truth. Amen. There's happiness. You know what? You might not have to build onto the building, but if you have the presence of God, you know what? That's enough. That's right. Uh, you, you, you remember we talked about last week, or maybe it was Wednesday night, what filled the house in the day of Isaiah? The presence of the Lord. And you know what? He didn't have 50 in the meeting. He's there by himself. And it said his train filled the temple. The whole house was filled with the presence of the Almighty. That's what we need. So, this attack, when it didn't work on the congregation, he went to Hezekiah himself and said, Hezekiah, you're messing up. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your breath. We're going to take you down. And you know what? Satan comes that way all the time. And I don't know why, how he does it to you. But he does it this way to me. He has two attacks for me. Give up, Larry. You've been in this for nearly 25 years. Just give up. You know what? When you get nearly 50 years old, it's hard to work a full-time job and to pastor too. 25 years ago, 20, 18 years ago, 10 years ago when we built this building, I could still do it easy. It, it, it's been a big change in the last 10 years. But you know what? Satan's just telling me a lie. You know, through the strength of the Almighty, I can do it. Yeah. When I, when, I, when I began to think of how He empowered people, you know what? Moses was still leading the congregation at 120 mm -hmm. and said that he was still like a young man. And even when he laid down his life and it was time for him to head out of here, he still had the, the body of a young man. You know, that's what God can do. So when, when, when Satan approaches you with these little things, tell him he's a liar. Another thing he tries to gig me with is my health. You'd feel better if you wasn't doing 50 things at the same time. That seizure two weeks ago. All oh, Larry, they're coming back. I bet you lesions is back too. Mm -hmm. You know what? They may be, but you know what? <laughs> That's plain of God. And more so, it's probably a lie right out of the pits of hell. But so he will tell you a lot of things. The problem is, huh, we began to believe them. See, when, 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 when we cross the line where we believe Satan over the Lord Jesus, then, then you know what it becomes? It becomes sin. When, when we began to embrace what Satan has to offer more than what the Lord Jesus is telling us, it's sin in our own lives. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Really an accounting of the same thing from the opposite side of the nation, from the Judean side of the uh, or rather from the Israeli side of the, na the nation. Uh, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 15. Uh, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says this, Now therefore let not Hezekiah deceive you, nor persuade you on this matter, neither, let him, neither yet believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand and out of the hand of my fathers, much less your God deliver you out of my hand. Now, I want you to see the next lie that is always out there is your God's not able. Your God's not effective. And, and you know how they began to convince you of that? Comparing what is here out to the world. You just look at so and so, uh, uh, and not to be critical, but just a name everybody knows. Billy Graham is 100 years old now. And you know what? In man's eyes, I know one time for sure that he spoke to a hundred thousand people at one time. That's a lot of people. But don't start comparing it that way. That didn't make that sermon effective, did it? Now, I don't know what happened. You probably had a bunch of people moving. 
But you know what? Snakes move. Right? Mm -hmm. So don't start comparing. See, he says, you, you look at these other feeble nations. We took them down like you wouldn't believe and their gods didn't help you and your God won't help you either. You know what? The Bible says this, that He's an ever-present help in time of need. That's right. And I'll claim that. And I'll say, yes, He will help me. It may not look like it to the world, but He will help me because He's great and marvelous and mighty. Do you believe that? I mean, do you really believe that? Or is it just something that you've heard so long that you can repeat? You, you, you know when you begin to believe it? When it becomes a reality in your life and you face something and there is nothing left but the Lord God. Amen. That, that, that's when you'll really, really begin to believe it. And so we see that it is, the, it is always the approach of the enemy to uh, to uh, lessen and to reduce and, and to question the power of God, and that is a deception. That is Him coming against you to deceive. Now look with me in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter forty nine, Jer Jeremiah chapter forty nine and verse fourteen, Jeremiah forty nine and verse fourteen. I've heard a rumor from the Lord. And an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, Gather you together, and come and, and against her, and rise up to and rise up to the battle. For lo, I will make thee a, make thee small among the heathen, and despised among men. That's his attack against Israel. Thy thy, tri, thy terribleness have deceived thee. And did you get that? Your own terribleness has deceived thee. You know what? Sometimes you can deceive yourself. You ever heard the old adage, I'm my own, <laughs> you're your own worst enemy? A whole lot of truth in that. And he says, Thy terribleness, thy sinfulness, your ungodliness, it's deceived you. Now, it, it, it will never say... You know what? And, and not to talk to anybody uh, about anybody in specifics, but sodomites is a good example. And, and when they come out, you'll find people group hugging them and, and, and just, you know, oh, that's so great and that's so brave. You've done such a brave thing. You know what? That is terrible deceitfulness. You know what that lifestyle is? It's ungodly. It's right out of the pits of hell. And one, you know what? God's already judged. Ju He's judged in my lifetime. You, you, you think AIDS is a happenstance? You know, even today, and the first time I heard the word AIDS, I think it was 1982. Mm -hmm. And everybody, you know, what was in? Well, you know what? It's in that population, but it's in everywhere. You know, the funny thing to me, still the most of them is in that population, and that's most of them still dying. And you know why? It's because it is a judgment. But they're deceived. Yeah. And you know what? It, 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 they're, 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 everybody just tickle pink about it. They're deceived. The terribleness, uh, a terrible deceitfulness is what we live in today. Yeah. And we, we need to be led by God. We need to, we need to trust His Word. And, and let me say this. Don't you trust what you feel. You know, I've heard all people say, well, I feel really good about this. Well, so what? I'm sure Eve felt really good about that piece of fruit, didn't you? Go with the Word of God. Look into the Word. I just don't believe it that way. Well, it don't matter if it's in the Word of God. You've got to accept it. And your opinion of that, you know what? It just don't matter. Are you deceived? And, and so we see that the Israel abided in a great deception and what was going to happen is judgment because they lived in a deception that, that, that the, Bible, the Bible calls here is terrible. Let's read the rest of verse 16. Thy terribleness have deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. Now, this is speaking of Israel, and I've heard 
the different things and suggestions about the the rock and many people think it's the city of Petra. But you know, I don't know about that. But what that that's something that's still to come. But Israel was to, uh, depending on a man-made protection. This city that they had created, they thought it was impractical. They, they didn't think anybody could pass it. But you know what? It wasn't. And it was. They did cross it. And they did destroy it. We need to understand and know that we are a vulnerable people and we can be deceived. And without the goodness of God, that's what we got. That, that, that's what we got in store. And so you know the rest of the story. The nation was destroyed and it, and it ceased to be a people. And the reason why was sin. We need to understand that that's a deceivableness that's out there. Go me to the Gospel of Matthew. Very familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, prediction of the end time, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4. Matthew 24 and verse 4. The Lord Jesus says this, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, I want you to see that, that He says, you be cautious, take heed, be warned. That, and you know what? It wasn't, even, it wasn't even six hours and they were deceived. They, 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 they were duped. You, you, you know why? You know why they denied Him? It's because they were deceived. They believed that the opposition was greater than the Lord Jesus. They believed that their lives were more important than, be, than to being committed to Christ. They were deceived. Be, huh, uh, what, what are you deceived about? What, what is the major deception in your life? Is it that you're self-effective? Is it that, hey, I've got, I've got money... And I've got a steady income and it's going to be okay. You know what you have? That's a deception. Because this right here might not be worth even the metal that took to make it tomorrow. Right? Don't be deceived. And, 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 and so we see then that, that the Bible says here that the Lord Jesus, you take heed and you be careful because I don't want you Deceived, And it was a very real possibility. Verse 5, For many shall come in My name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, I want to look at that in two ways very quickly. The first is this, and it hasn't happened very frequently yet, but you'll see it eventually. There'll be literally men saying, I am God. But I'll tell you what they are saying. People that say Christ is insufficient, they're saying we're Christians. You know what the Catholics will tell you? They'll tell you they're Christians. Right? But you know what? They're not. They, they don't believe the teachings of Christ. That, that's what a Christian is, right? Someone who believes the teachings of Christ. You know what? I don't care who they are or how sweet they are. If they believe in regeneration by water, they're deceived. If they say that Christ's blood was insufficient, they're deceived. Right? And so, is that not these deceived supposed Christians? Aren't they saying all the time, I'm a Christian, we can fellowship. Yeah. They're just, don't be deceived by that. Don't you be tricked by them. Be honest with them. You don't have to be mean, but you be honest with them. And say, what, you know, uh, the first thing I always say when somebody raps on my door is, do you got a King James with you? 
And most of the time, that'll stop most of them because they don't. Don't be deceived. Don't, don't, don't be sucked in because many times uh, we are because, you know, we live in the world about, well, you know, uh, you can't even find a sinner with, with, with radar because everybody's Christian. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Very same thing I was saying. Drop down to verse 24. And there shall arise false Christ, and those are coming, those individuals that say, I am the Messiah. And there shall arise false Christ, and false prophets or preachers, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, that they would deceive the very elect. Now, I want you to see what, what it's saying about that is... Uh, First of all, the elect, the predestined, we can't be deceived, but the power will be so great. You remember when John was caught up to the third heaven and the Lord showed, showed him the great whore? And he said, I wonder with admiration. That's right. See, he was almost deceived, wasn't he? That means you can be too. Means I can be. Right? And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that when deception comes, we need to be on guard. When something new runs out of the gate, we need to evaluate. And you know what? Uh, I don't believe anything new is very is worthy of us to consider much. Because you know what? The Lord Jesus said on the day of crucifixion, He says, it's finished. You know what he says at the end of John's revelation? Anybody that adds anything to this book, I am under them of uh, the destruction that's written in it. We don't need something new. We just need to claim to that which is true. And so then we as the Lord's people, I want you to see that we are not, uh, we're not exempt and we're not, we're, we're not, uh, uh, <laughs> Not, uh, it's not beyond the possibility for us to be deceived. Uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is the one that's going to get you. Remember the character of the Corinthian church. It's full of sin, even down to the point a man was having a relationship with his stepmom. The church wouldn't address it. Remember? 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 18, the Bible says this, Let no man, let no man deceive himself. Yeah. And see, we're, we're really good at that, ain't we? Well, you know, hey, that ain't too bad. Ladies, watch your hemline. Then come up, pat, you know, what, what, I, what I have found is it's directly when, when the hemline comes up, so does immorality. Right? Don't be deceived. You say, we well, get too close to home. Well, sorry. Well, no, I'll take it back. I'm not sorry. Right? That's a deception. That, 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 that is being deceived. And, and so often what we do in deceiving ourselves is convincing ourselves that everything's all okay. okay When I'm far from the Lord, I shouldn't deceive myself and say, hey, everything's alright. When I'm far from the Lord and I haven't heard from the Holy Spirit in months, you know what? It's not good for me to say, Woo! Thank you, Jesus! Because I'm deceived. Don't deceive yourself and convince yourself everything's okay when it's not. You be honest about it. You, you, because listen, what, what that, what the direction that always goes to, and I'll tell you this unequivocally, what it always goes to is more immorality. Every time, that's where it goes. Then he says, "Let no man deceive himself. 
If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Now what he was saying there, when, uh, when you think you got it all figured out, remember how stupid you are. I think often, you know, uh, when I was about 18 or 19, I, man, I thought that I knew everything. And you know, what I've done is deceive myself. I convinced myself if uh, I got through nursing school, me and Donna wouldn't have any more money problems. You know what I did? I deceived myself. Because what, what, you know what this flesh would do? Whatever money you have, you will spend it. Now, that, that's his nature. Deceive yourself. And, and, and so... What you need to remember is this. Don't be deceived. Don't you convince yourself everything's alright when you know good and well it's not. Don't deceive yourself. Now, uh, I love the teachings of the Holy Ghost. And we as Baptists ignore most of that because you know why? One thing is because we don't understand it. And, and the other thing is we don't want to understand it. But you know, concerning the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, don't deceive yourself in emotionalism and the Holy Ghost. There is a huge difference. So are you standing in deception? You know, uh, I bet the morning that Eve woke up, she wasn't on guard. <coughs> and so she was deceived. I bet when David looked across the city and saw Bathsheba, you know why he was deceived? He wasn't on guard. And you know why we'll get deceived? He's going to let you guard down. You're not alert as you need to be. Have you been deceived? You know, another deception is this. Him making you believe you saved when you lost is a goose in hell. And you know how that goes? A couple of different ways. First of all, easy believism. Where you just say a simple prayer and that thing is okay. You know what? It's a deception. And you run from it. The other deception goes this way. Emotionalism. Just because you uh, cry a few tears, everything's going to be alright. You know what? Nothing further could be from the truth. I had a, I had a dog when I was a kid named Stupid. He got hit by a car and I cried. But you know what? There was no spirituality in that. I cried because my dog got hit by a car. There's some emotionalism. I didn't want to see him hurt. But it was no redemption and it was. So where do you stand? What's your need? Be aware of the deceiver. Because he's out there. He does a really good job. He's had more practice than you will in this lifetime. Right. <laughs> Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived.